So, as we saw, the third strategy for trying to accept the repugnant conclusion is to look for independent arguments in favour of it. Uh, we saw that Michael Humer tried to give an independent argu argument for it, not one that I found especially convincing. But uh, another possible argument is based on John Rawls's Veil of Ignorance. And this was suggested by Torbian Tenzio. Uh, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, by the way. Uh, if not, so be it. Um, also, I'm not sure if he would support this argument in the form that I'm giving it, but it was his work that suggested it to me. Okay, the veil of ignorance was suggested by John Rawls as a way to determine the moral status of particular social policies. The idea is that when you're considering uh, social policies, what you should do, according to Rawls, is to imagine that you're about to... Um, Imagine that you're about to enter a society in which this policy is enacted, but where you don't know anything about what your own status will be. You don't know your race, your nationality, your class, your sex. You're completely ignorant of your own position. You're behind a veil of ignorance. Uh, so suppose you think, wouldn't it be cool if we could enslave 20% of people, we'd get a lot more work done, we'd become a lot more productive? If you're considering that from behind the veil of ignorance, you don't know who you're going to be in this society, so there's a 20% chance that you'll end up enslaved. And most people wouldn't want to take that chance, even if it would result in more productivity. So the, the, the kind of the right, the fair thing to do uh, is not have that policy. So how do we apply this to the present case? Well, we've got these two worlds, A and Z. It's tempting to say... Looking at it from the veil of ignorance, everyone in, Z, in A is really well off. Everyone in Z has a life barely worth living, so let's go for world A. Uh, that would clearly be the better, better life. But uh, Tenzio suggests that this isn't the right way to look at it, because you're only considering the average welfare. You're not taking into account the difference in population, which is what the repugnant conclusion rests on. So he suggests that when we compare A and Z from behind the veil of ignorance, we should do it this way. Uh, imagine that you're told you've been randomly assigned a life in either A or Z, but you don't know which one. Uh, now you have to choose whether to realise A or Z. If you choose A and you've been assigned to Z, then you cease to exist, uh, and vice versa. I in this case, surely you'd go for Z. There are, there are many more people in Z, so you're many, many times more likely to have been assigned to Z. So the conclusion uh, is that if we adopt rules as veil of ignorance in a way that takes into account all of the relevant factors, then Z is clearly preferable. Notice, incidentally, that this veil of ignorance argument could prove much more than the original repugnant conclusion. Imagine that the lives in Z are not worth living. You might think that having a bad life is better than having no life at all, in which case you'll choose to realise world Z. So maybe this, this argument proves too much. Right, uh, the fourth strategy is to deny that the repugnant conclusion is actually counterintuitive. Deny that the repugnant conclusion is actually repugnant. The primary way to argue this, uh, in fact the only way that I'm aware of, is to try revising the concept of a life barely worth living. Quite a lot turns on this concept. Um, if we want to compare world A to world Z, we need to have a good grasp on what a life barely worth living is. But a lot of philosophers have suggested that we're just confused, that actually a life barely worth living isn't nearly as bad as we uh, think it is. So recall the point I emphasised in the first video. The lives in Z aren't wonderful, but they're not terribly bad. As Parfit says, uh, they're lives of muzak and potatoes. It can be tempting when you hear the phrase a life barely worth living, to imagine starvation, disease, war, the kind of lives led in the most terrible poverty-stricken areas of a place like Somalia, for instance. But uh, it's obvious that this is too much. Uh, this certainly wasn't what Parfit had in mind. Um, the, the, the lives in Z are, are actually better than that. They're much better than that. So what then is a life barely worth living? Well, uh, according to Torbian Tenzio, again, provided that our basic needs are satisfied, our lives are worth living. And he then argues that we, we, we very rarely go beyond this level, no matter how advanced or affluent we are, no matter how many material possessions we have, no matter how many of our plans come to fruition, uh, 
Um, I mean, the main point here is that humans adjust. We're not actually much happier now than we were when we were in small-scale societies. As we've accumulated more material possessions, we've simply come to have more desires, more needs. The basic state of life is just kind of neutral, not especially good or bad. So Tenzio suggests that even people living you know, apparently good lives in very rich, affluent countries, even they have lives barely worth living. Uh, even, they, even their lives only occasionally kind of go into the good. And I suppose there's something intuitively right about this. I mean, personally, I think my life is great, but even on a good day, I'm not constantly happy. I'm just in a kind of neutral state. And when something good does happen, my happiness isn't usually especially intense. It often doesn't last as long as I expect. Think of uh, something like wanting a new TV for ages. You finally get it. Well, you'll be happy for a little while, uh, but you adjust to it pretty quickly and then just go back to neutral. Also, bear in mind things like depression and other mental illnesses in our societies. Something like a quarter of people have some kind of mental illness. At the very least, the lives of people in the A world are much better than ours. Um, maybe we do only have lives barely worth living. Uh, I don't think our lives are bad, but it's... Yes, it's... There is, I think, something intuitively right about this. Our lives maybe are not as good as we might initially think they are. So, um, the, the argument is then that since our lives are pretty much Z lives, and since our lives are perfectly acceptable, there isn't really anything repugnant about the repugnant conclusion. Surely it wouldn't be bad to create billions of people living lives of a standard that rich, affluent people in the real world have. And of course, if the tri if the lives of tribal peoples aren't really any, any w much worse than ours, uh, what would be wrong with billions of lives like theirs? Um, so I guess there's something intuitive about that. One of the main problems with these kinds of revisionary arguments is uh, just look around the world. Many people have terrible lives. If our lives are barely worth living theirs must be not worth living at all, um, yet they don't commit suicide. How would a person in a war-torn, disease-ridden area of Somalia feel if they were told that their life isn't worth living? I mean, it certainly seems that they disagree. They seem to think it's worth living. And in fact, we probably disagree too. We don't advise them to go and commit suicide. So uh, the point is this. The lives of many people in Somalia are above the zero level. Uh, you know, the zero level being the sort of the level just in between worth living and not worth living. The lives of people in Somalia are above that. They are worth living. But the lives of many people in Somalia are much worse than our lives. So our lives are, are much higher than the zero level. They must be much better than lives only barely worth living. I think defenders of the revisionary argument have quite a plausible response to this. Um, a life worth living means a life which is on average good. And the simple fact is that people's inclination to commit suicide, for instance, is far from a perfect indicator of how good their lives are. People don't commit suicide for many reasons. They have responsibilities to other people in this life. They hope for a better future. They have religious commitments which uh, are against suicide. They have an irrational fear of death and so on. And in fact, they might be making the right decision. Just because you have a bad life, it doesn't necessarily mean you should commit suicide. You might have some sort of obligation to stay alive, to help other people and so on. So even if you have a bad life, it doesn't necessarily mean it would be right to commit suicide. Um, another problem with uh, these arguments is that my situation could change for the worse, much worse, but my life would still be worth living. Suppose over the next year I'm extremely unlucky. I have a series of accidents where I first lose my arm, then my other arm, then my leg, then my next leg, then I become deaf. Well, surely my life has become progressively worse, but it's still worth living. Um, I, 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 would, I wouldn't think that uh, it would be better not to exist if any of those things happened. I'd be pretty sad, but it would still be worth living. Um, so my present life is much better than it would be if I had a series of accidents. My life, if I had a series of accidents, would still be worth living. So my present life is much better than a life barely worth living. Uh, as, as with the uh, previous argument, there's a simple response to this. 
as I mentioned earlier, humans adjust. If you lost all your limbs, what you what would probably happen, um, what's sort of psychologically more likely is that you'd feel terrible for a short while, but then your mood would improve. You would learn to live with the uh, with the disability, and I think that you'll find that this is the experience of many people who have these kinds of disabilities later in life. They'll say it's difficult at first, but eventually you get used to it, um, and probably quite quite quickly you kind of just adjust to the life you have. Um, in general, when we think about the welfare level of a life, you have to bear in mind that it's largely subjective. If you lose all your limbs, then objectively you'll have lost many of your skills and abilities. Similarly, if you consider people in tribal societies, they don't have all the material possessions we have. So objectively, they have less than us in an important sense. But none of this means that they have lower welfare. So I think it's plausible that the, the Z lives aren't as bad as we initially expect. However, there is a much deeper problem with Ten Tenzio's argument, which is that Tenzio simply misses the point. Tenzio seem, seems to be arguing like this. If our lives are like Z lives, then the repugnant conclusion isn't repugnant. Our lives are like Z lives, therefore the repugnant conclusion isn't repugnant. Now, the problem with this argument is that the repugnant conclusion concerns the comparison of world Z to world A. The repugnant conclusion isn't about Z itself, it's about how Z compares to A. I mean, very few people, I assume, would say that Z is repugnant in itself. The thought of billions of people uh, whose lives aren't that bad but not that good either, that's not in itself repugnant. What's repugnant is the thought that world Z this Muzak and Potatoes world, is better than World A. Even if we do lead lives barely worth living, would we say that a world with a huge number of such lives is better than World A? If our lives are like Z lives, then when we imagine World A, we need to imagine a world of people whose lives are significantly better than ours. So, that's one of the main objections to this argument. Uh, however, Thomas Peterson suggests uh, a rather different way of, of reading Tenzio's argument. Um, according to Peterson, Tenzio is actually making an argument about conceivability. So the, the argument on this reading goes more like this. We cannot conceive of what life in world A is like. If we cannot conceive of what life in world A is like, we cannot compare A lives to Z lives. If we cannot compare A lives to Z lives, we cannot claim it is repugnant to imply that world Z is better than world A. Hence, we cannot claim that the repugnant conclusion is repugnant. So let's consider the uh, first premise. Tenzio argues that people in the Z world have lives basically like ours. Even most uh, rich, affluent people have lives only barely worth living. If we accept this, then the lives of people in world A are hundreds of times better than ours. Is it really possible to conceive of what this means? We can all imagine lives better than our own. Imagine yourself, except you have a life without any pain. You're doing your ideal job. You get to travel the world and see whatever you like. You have a lot of drive. You achieve all your goals and so on. Now, how much better would this life be to the one you have now? Uh, I mean, it would be better, I, I assume, but it wouldn't be enormously better. Maybe twice as good. What would it mean to have a life a hundred times as good? It's difficult to get our heads around what this would be. In which case, we can't really conceive of what life in the A world is like. The second premise says that if we can't conceive of what life in A is like, uh, we can't compare A lives to Z lives. So this rests on the assumption that in order to compare two things, in order to say that this is better than this, we have to be able to picture what those two things involve. Uh, I can say that I wouldn't like milk and mustard and Coca-Cola all mixed together because... I have a pretty good idea of what that would be like. Uh, however, I think this premise is very questionable, and it's because there are different senses of conceivable. We can't conceive of what World A is like in what sense exactly. Uh, consider a really, really big number, like Graham's number. In, in many ways, I can't conceive of Graham's number. It's so big, no human could even begin to have an intuitive grasp of it. 
But I can still make comparisons between Graham's number and other numbers. For instance, Graham's number is larger than 10. Mathematicians have studied Graham's number, and they can explain various properties it has. It's divisible by 3. So I think it's just false to say that the fact that we can't comprehend what an A life is like means we can't say that A is better than Z. Uh, consider, for instance, the Holocaust. About uh, 11, pe 11 million people were killed, uh, 6 million Jews and 5 million of various other groups. You can't possibly comprehend the magnitude of horror of something like that. It's incomprehensible in many ways. First of all, the, the very number, 11 million, is bigger than anything that makes sense to us. We just can't get our heads around a number that big. It's also uh, incomprehensible in a kind of psychological sense. It, it never makes any sense how anybody could do that. I mean, historians have offered various explanations, uh, but there's always something missing. You, you never go, ah yes, that makes sense now. Uh, well, it never makes sense to me at any rate. I mean, some atrocities I can understand, like uh, Islamic fundamentalists who fly themselves into buildings. I don't support that, obviously, but I, I, I get it in the sense that I understand the motivation. I kind of understand the psychology that would lead somebody to do that. But with, with the Holocaust, it, it just never, it never makes sense. I never, it, I can't ever even understand it. I never get it. You know, it, it's just beyond me. So the Holocaust is incomprehensible, inconceivable. But if some ethical theory entails, for instance, the Holocaust is better than drug prohibition, well, that conclusion is repugnant. Um, I don't support drug prohibition, by the way. I'm in favour of pretty much total legalisation. But if you say the Holocaust is better than drug prohibition, that would be a repugnant conclusion. So similarly, even if we can't really comprehend world A, we can still say that the conclusion that Z is better than A is repugnant. We can still make that judgment. I suppose instead of talking about conceivability, we could talk about logical possibility. We might be using the word conceivable in that sense. You know, it's inconceivable in the sense that it's logically impossible. So we could say it's just logically impossible for a life to be hundreds of times better than ours. We'd need an argument for that, though, and I'm, I'm not sure how that would go. Um, so I, 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 however, we, whether we read Tenzio's argument uh, in the first way that I suggested, or in terms of conceivability, I'm, I'm not sure it's really that persuasive. Right, uh, whether or not we find this argument convincing, the biggest problem for this kind of strategy is the reverse repugnant conclusion. Imagine a world A-, minus, a world of one million people in excruciating agony, the worst life imaginable, just constant torture for a hundred years. Then there's world Z-, minus, which is full of billions and billions and billions of people with lives barely not worth living. These are lives that are just below the zero level. With, with only a few improvements, they would become worthwhile. You can see where this is going. The reverse repugnant conclusion says that Z- minus is worse than A-. Minus. Uh, I, I won't go through the, the argument again, you can do it yourself, because it's basically the same as the argument for the standard repugnant conclusion. Anyway, this conclusion is already fairly repugnant, but notice that if we accept Tenzio's argument, if we, accept, if we agree with Tenzio's view, then the reverse repugnant conclusion becomes even worse. Because if we hold that a life barely worth living isn't that bad, that a life barely worth living is much better than we usually imagine, then a life barely not worth living must be better than we usually imagine as well, since a life barely not worth living is only slightly worse than a life barely worth living. In which case, the reverse repugnant conclusion becomes even more counterintuitive. As, as we raise the zero level, the reverse repugnant conclusion becomes even more absurd. Tenzio's view is that a life barely worth living is in fact uh, much like what many affluent people in the developed world have. Well, in that case, a life barely not worth living must be slightly worse than our lives. A world of millions of people in excruciating agony is better than a world with billions upon billions upon billions of these people. I mean, that really is absurd. That really is repugnant, I, I, I think. The point is this. If we want to bite the bullet and accept the repugnant conclusion, we really have to bite it. 
if we can argue that the, repu the original repugnant conclusion isn't so repugnant, we'll be forced to accept some other conclusion that really is repugnant. The less repugnant we make the repugnant conclusion, the more repugnant the reverse repugnant conclusion becomes. So uh, this whole strategy of trying to revise the notion of what it means to have a life barely worth living, I think is, is doomed to fail. Okay, finally, um, finally we can, uh, final strategy for accepting the repugnant conclusion is to suggest that if we, if we, if we reject it, we land ourselves in worse trouble. Um, we deny that there are any acceptable alternatives to uh, accepting it. And this is um, really a formal statement of the point I made in the first video. It seems that whenever we try to block the repugnant conclusion, we end up with conclusions that are just as bad, maybe worse. Um, and there is in fact a formal proof of this in the paper An Impossibility Theorem for Welfarist Axiologies by Gustav Ar Arrhenius. Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. But basically, Arrhenius proves that any theory which satisfies three uh, very, very intuitive principles must entail either the repugnant conclusion or one of two conclusions that seem to be just as bad as the repugnant conclusion. Now, I'm not going to explain the details of the proof because it's technical and I can't be bothered to learn it. Uh, sorry, but I'll tell you what he shows. Um, so consider these three principles. The dominance principle, which is that if a population A contains the same number of people as a population B, and every person in A has higher welfare than any person in B, then A is better than B. This is pretty much undeniable, right? I mean, all we're doing here is raising the welfare of everybody. Um, they're the same number of people. Okay, we can imagine that the same population, A just has higher welfare than, than B. Everybody in A has higher welfare than everyone in B. So surely A is better than B. I, I can't see any way out around this, this principle. Uh, the addition principle. If it is bad to add a number of people, all with welfare lower than the original people, then it is at least as bad to add a greater number of people, all with even lower welfare than the original people. Again, I, I don't really see any denying this. Uh, suppose we're at a welfare level of 80. Um, now imagine we say it would be bad to add a hundred people with a welfare level of 60. Maybe you think that wouldn't be bad, but let's just suppose it is. Let's suppose, you know, if we're at a welfare level of 80, then it would be bad to add a hundred people with a welfare level of 60. Now, if that's bad, then it surely it must be just as bad, or, or, well, surely it must be worse even, to add 200 people with a welfare level of 40. I mean, again, this is just so intuitive. There doesn't really seem any, any, any way around this. Um, the minimal non-extreme priority principle. There is a number n such that an addition of n people with very high welfare and a single person with slightly negative welfare is at least as good as an addition of the same number of people but with very low positive welfare. So suppose you have a choice between adding a billion people with lives of ecstasy plus one person whose life is barely not worth living. Or a billion and one people with lives barely worth living. Uh, surely we'd all go for the former choice. I mean, in, in, in the first case, only one person is slightly worse off. Everybody else is far, far better off. So again, this just seems, you know, I, I can't really imagine anyone denying this. So the, all of these principles seem com totally intuitive. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I assume that these seem obviously right to most people. Um, may maybe there are some of you who disagree with one or more of them, but if so, you probably hold quite unusual moral views. So here's the problem. Any theory that satisfies these three principles must entail either the repugnant conclusion or one of these two conclusions. Anti-egalitarianism. A population with perfect equality can be worse than a population with the same number of people, inequality, and a lower average positive welfare. Uh, this is just ridiculous. Two populations um, you know, with, the, with the same number of people, but one is unequal and has lower welfare. Would anybody say that the unequal one with lower welfare is the better one? I, I mean, the, the only way you could 
accept this as if you think that inequality is just like really really good and that again it would be very odd i think to think that uh, the sadistic conclusion when adding people without affecting the original people's welfare it can be better to add people with negative welfare than positive welfare i mean surely if you have to add people it's, it's better to add people with with positive welfare um again it seems obvious so so to to to, to conclude then if we want to reject the repugnant conclusion, we must either reject uh, one of the three principles we saw, or we have to accept one of these two conclusions. Now, when we put the point, point like this, it seems like even if the repugnant conclusion is repugnant, it's less repugnant than the alternatives. Uh, Arrhenius himself concludes that there just is no acceptable population ethics. He thinks he's, he's shown that there's just no way of, of having a kind of... Um, population ethics that that, we, that is acceptable but the other way to look at it is is that we have to have some sort of ethical theory for dealing with populations uh, and accepting the repugnant conclusion is the least bad of all the options so we have to accept the repugnant conclusion uh, now I should note that some people have suggested that Arrhenius's proof isn't watertight um, that there are ways around it you know other options he hasn't fully ruled out however there are other proofs that lead to the same conclusion um, I think we can say, you know, if you want to avoid the repugnant conclusion, you're setting yourself a very, very difficult task. Or, or you, you know, it's, it's not sort of obvious how to get around it easily. So, um, that might be seen as quite a powerful reason to simply accept it. Um, okay, well, that's, that's it. Those are the, the five strategies that I can, I've, I've found in the literature for accepting the repugnant conclusion. Um, but before I finish, I just wanted to note that there are many varieties of the repugnant conclusion. Um, I mean, in fact, we've already seen, you know, one of them, the reverse repugnant conclusion. We, we saw that earlier. And if we want, and if we try to accept one of them, if we want to accept one repugnant conclusion, we're probably going to have to accept a bunch of them. So we imagined world Z as a drab world, a world of muzak and potatoes. But there are other ways of imagining Z. Z can be anything, as long as the average welfare ends up as just above the zero level. So one way, then, is to say that the lives in Z switch between ecstatic pleasure and agonising pain. One day is fantastic, the next is terribly bad. There's, there's just enough pleasure overall to push it above average. Uh, and obviously, A, the world A is normal, there's a million people with fantastic lives. The same argument that leads to the repugnant conclusion will show that Z is better than A in this case too. Or we could um, apply this to whole lives. We could say that in Z, 51% of people live fantastic lives, 49% of people live uh, terrible lives. There's the short-lived world. Imagine that world A contains uh, a billion people who are perfectly content, who live for 80 years. World Z contains an enormous number of people who exist only for five seconds. They pop into existence, content for five seconds, and then they're extinguished. World, um, another repugnant conclusion, world A contains billions of people with good lives. In world Z, uh, there's exactly the same uh, setup, but with one change. A single person spends a life in excruciating agony, the worst life possible. Everybody else receives a, a minor, barely even noticeable improvement in pleasure. They notice that their window is shiny, for instance. Uh, as long as there's enough people who receive that barely noticeable improvement in pleasure, that will outweigh the uh, the pain of the excruciating life. In in all these cases, world Z can easily be shown to be superior to world A. We can also apply the repugnant conclusion to single lives. Uh, life A is a century of ecstasy. Life Z is billions and billions of years of a life barely worth living. Surely the century of ecstasy is preferable. Actually, my own intuitions go the opposite way here. Maybe I'm, I'm just too scared to die or something, but um, personally, I'd, I'd rather have life Z. Uh, but it does seem, though, that, that many people find the idea of this kind of drab eternity, as Parfit puts it, uh, to be very awful. So, um, so, yes, there are many variants of the repugnant conclusion. Should we accept all of these variants? Uh, exactly the same argument that leads to the repugnant conclusion should force us to say that Z is better in these cases as well. Um, okay, well, I might as well 
conclude with some of my own feelings about this. Um, I mentioned earlier the impossibility proof. If we want to reject the repugnant conclusion, we have to reject either a very plausible sounding principle or accept a conclusion that's just as or more repugnant. But this is only the case if we're desperate to avoid contradictions. My attitude is, why not just accept contradictions in our moral theory? Um, I don't believe that ethics is a science. I don't believe there are moral facts. I'm pretty much an emotivist. I think that when we make moral claims, we're just expressing our emotional attitudes. Contradictions are a problem if we're doing science, if we're dealing with the objective world. But if you hold contradictory moral judgments, all that means is that there's some sort of clash in your attitudes. Now often we don't want our attitudes to clash, so when we detect a clash, we'll try to revise our attitudes so that they no longer clash. But occasionally the, the cost of revising our attitudes is so high, um, sorry, the cost of revising our attitudes so that they no longer clash is higher than the cost of just having attitudes that clash. And I, I think this is probably the case with the repugnant conclusion. Um, I reject the repugnant conclusion. I reject the sadistic and the anti-egalitarian conclusions. And I accept each of the dominance, addition and minimal non-extreme priority principles. This will lead to a contradiction. And that seems fine to me. I'm much happier to live with contradictory moral attitudes than I am to accept any of those conclusions or reject any of those principles. Now, of course, the standard response to this will be, you know, you can't accept contradictions, it's irrational, it's incoherent, it doesn't make sense, etc, etc. Uh, you know, paraconsistent logics have been around for decades now, they're very well understood, we've got inconsistent geometry, inconsistent arithmetic, contradictions aren't as scary as they used to be. So that's my way of looking at this. Uh, I, I'd say that in morality you can have your cake and eat it too as long as your cake is made with paraconsistent ingredients. Um, okay, well that's all I'll say about this here. This is really about people who want to accept the repugnant conclusion and uh, we've just seen some uh, some ways of doing that. Um, and yes, that's that's all I want to talk about for now. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.